Good morning. Welcome to Center Point Church for April 19th, 2020. We are so glad that you've chosen uh, to tune in this morning and join us as we worship our awesome God. In Psalm 65, we read these words. What mighty praise, O God, belongs to you in Zion. We will fulfill our vows to you, for you answer our prayers. All of us must come to you. Though we are overwhelmed by our sins, you forgive them all. What joy for those you choose to bring near, those who live in your holy courts. What festivities await us inside your holy temple. You faithfully answer our prayers with awesome deeds, O God, our Savior. You are the hope of everyone on earth. Friends, we worship an incredible God who answers prayer. And for the last nine weeks, we have been asking Jesus to teach us to pray. And we've been asking you as a congregation to uh, take note of what you've been praying and begin to look to see how has God answered your prayers. And as we get into worship, we want to begin by celebrating those answered prayers. And so we're excited to share those with you. Uh, and then following the prayers, we are going to sing and we're going to respond and we are going to worship our awesome, everlasting God. When we started our journey through prayer, my big prayer request was, uh, God, give me wisdom and diligence in parenting. And before all of the self-isolation stuff, um, you know, we felt like we were on a pretty good track. Uh, the kids were all involved in their activities. They were having fun. Uh, but I just recognized that, uh, that there was more, that there was more that God wanted me to be as a parent. And uh, as I was praying and as we've been praying, God, give us wisdom and diligence in parenting. It's been amazing how this self-isolation has provided new opportunities to uh, be at home, to connect with our kids, and also to help them walk through some pretty serious issues. Uh, what do you do when life hands you disappointment? What do you do when you can't do what you want to do? How do you respond? And so we've just been so blessed, and I've just seen God show up in so many different ways as we've had new opportunities to spend time with our kids, and as we've uh, dealt with some really hard stuff with them, and uh, pointed them to Jesus through it all. So as a family, we had decided we were going to go shopping for uh, our household and two additional households of folks that weren't able to go. And it was towards the end of March, right, and things were getting crazy around the grocery store. And they had some things on their list that were really hard to come by, like flour and yeast and toilet paper and uh, soap, hand sanitizer. There was quite a number of things, frozen vegetables, uh, beans. There are a lot of these things that we couldn't get. And uh, we had looked over the past week or so and often they were not available. Anyways, my wife had set aside a particular afternoon or early morning rather to go shopping for them and asked a few people to pray that some things would be there that hadn't been for a while. And sure enough, the next morning we went in and uh, all the frozen beans, there was plenty to be had. We, uh, we got our flour, a few bags had been restocked. We got uh, numerous other things, toilet paper, that hadn't been there for a while. And, uh, you know, we were thankful for our frontline workers who were stocking the shelves that night. But due to the timing, we're also thanking God for answered prayer. Hey, hey church. Um, we're uh, just wanted to join you this morning by saying that uh, we're thankful for all that God has done for us. Um, answer to prayer in a lot of ways of just taking care of us, taking care of our business, and even just uh, health as well in our family. I'm grateful that spring is not cancelled and the spring is still coming. Although it doesn't look like it if you pan our yard. However, <laughs> but spring will come. It always does. Spring is not cancelled and that just actually makes me happy. What about you? Um, I think for me, um, because of everything that's going on with less complications, I'll most likely be going to McEwen University next year through my auditions. So because of COVID-19, some of the requirements were taken off, so I will most likely be accepted for sure. So that's awesome. So we praise God with you guys. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. The battle belongs to you. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you. 
So as Pastor Nathan asked us to pray for the days of Lent and add something into our life, I decided this would be awesome. I don't want to take something out of my life. I want to add something into my life. For days of Lent, I did not do that. I did not pray. I did not read my Bible. I was so distant from the Lord. And at the beginning of April, God just kind of slammed my face into a door and said, hey, listen up. And so I did. And he told me that I need to be at Briarcrest Bible College come the fall of 2020. And so I looked into it, I applied and I've been accepted, and that's where I am going now. I stepped out on a limb, <laughs> I don't like it very much, but I'm excited to see where God has, what God has planned for me. My name is Christy, and Dale and I lived in Saskatchewan for a few years before we moved to Southern Ontario. And uh, our place in Saskatchewan just wouldn't sell. And we owned it for six years. Uh, we did have a renter for a while, so we're, we were very thankful to have those expenses covered for a bit. But um, then she moved out, and we didn't quite know what to do with it. It needed a lot of work, so we put it on the market six months ago, and nothing happened. But uh, March 12th, I think it was, just before the country went into lockdown, we got an offer. And we didn't know what was going to happen because, of course, he had all these conditions. He could have taken them off at any time. But the sale went through. They took possession today. And so I really believe that God has provided for us in a time of famine. And I want you to be encouraged that if he can do that for us, he can do that for you too. I don't, the thing that I'm probably most thankful for in this current circumstances that we live in is that uh, we personally and no one we are connected to personally has come down with the virus uh, even though there were one or two people who thought it was possible they turned out they didn't have it so God has been taking care of us God is good and uh, Denica was reading Psalms 112 the other day and or yesterday and Today. it pretty much says exactly what we're, we're thinking and feeling. Yes, that uh, uh, basically uh, in, in hard times, God is there and he protects us and uh, uh, just is with us all the time. And uh, uh, my answer to prayer is that, uh, yes, as John already alluded to, in my family who came from Europe, there is one uh, uh, person who um, we thought might have COVID, but uh, he has asthma too. So when they took him to the stalleries, he ended up just having what he very often has. And also one thing, I'm, uh, you know, that is an answer to prayer, is that now, since we have even more time on our hands, John has started working in the basement, and that's a really big answer to prayer for me. <laughs> so, yeah. Also an answer to prayer is the fact that uh, uh, I've been praying for cameras and people in our church and, and I see so much kindness and so much care for other people being spread all over the place. So. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory, the battle belongs to you. I'm gonna see a Hi church, um, this is Rafa, Rafael, and um, something, an answer to prayer in the last eight weeks, <clears throat> I think definitely would be um, the fact that I received my papers to continue to stay in Canada um, about a month ago. <clears throat> so I have been praying for that and it was an interesting time uh, for the last five months or so where I wasn't able to work and I was kind of in limbo <clears throat> so it was definitely a hard time but um, I'm thankful that God has provided everything for me to um, go and literally survive in Canada without a job and without being able to do many things uh, for five months a little over five months and part of it or I think the main part of it actually um, he provided me with a family so the geese breaks which I'm really thankful for I think that's the real blessing that has been going on in my life for the last eight years but um, just more recently, 
the fact that I got a I got a visa and one week later I was called and offered a job so now I'm working at Hope Mission so in this in these times where it's hard um, <clears throat> God decided I guess that my waiting time was over and now he provided um, the means for me to stay and also he provided a job um, when when sadly many people are um, losing their jobs so if anything uh, I can just try and encourage you um, to remember that God is faithful and even if things are hard right now like he'll he'll see you through it um, he, he saw me through it and he said what I needed so thank you and yeah I just want to say that I've been praying for all of my grandchildren and this week my grandchild Gianna who lives in Texas talked to me on FaceTime and she was very very excited because she spent she said a half an hour coming back to the Lord crying in her bed doing her ABC's and she had learned that in Sunday school a few years back it means admit and then be sorry and then confess and she said she did that and she just felt so happy when she was done I got a prayer. my prayer by I prayed on Easter morning the day that Jesus rose from the dead and he answered our prayer Lord please keep us safe amen God answered my prayer by keeping a job for me through this crisis and keeping the rest of my family safe and without major sickness. God's answered my prayers by keeping my family healthy and keeping us all together safe and strong. Giving us strength. Hi everybody, uh, the three prayers that we have been praying for personally uh, during these eight weeks, I would say they've all been answered. Um, first, the clarity with personal finances, pretty straightforward. Um, but yeah, we had some extra money come in and we just, we wanted to know where to put it um, for God's purpose and it was pretty clear. And the next one um, I had is for me personally, was um, learning more intercessory prayer. And I tell you with this situation, um, it's been pretty easy to, to learn how to pray more for others. And lastly, um, we had the, the health and safety of our kids through this time. And actually, you know what? It was before this time that we wrote this down, before COVID-19. So. That has been excellent. Our children are doing great. Thank you, Jesus. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is James. I'm Jane. And that's Brayden, and that's Nathaniel way back there. And uh, we get the honor of uh, leading you guys, Center Point Alliance Church, in worship this morning. And if uh, you're new to this and just tuning in, we welcome you here. I'm new to this church as well, and just checking it out with my friends. And it's an honor and uh, an excitement to be able to do this with you guys. And uh, Due to a, a technical issue for our first set of music, you won't actually see us. You'll just hear our voices. But later we'll do a song we'll be able to see, see our faces. So just prepare yourself for that. It'll just be a, a little, no video and just some sound. But we're going to enjoy it anyhow. And praise the Lord nonetheless. And I have a psalm I'm going to read for you guys that both connects with the testimonies that we just heard and also with the song we're about to sing together. And it's from Psalm 27, verse 13 and 14. I remain confident of this, 
I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. Wait for the Lord. I'll read verse 14 again just because it's the important part. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. And let's pray together before we sing these songs. Heavenly Father, we come before you with gratitude in our hearts for technology, gratitude for community even at a distance, and gratitude for um, health for those of us that are um, able to experience that. I pray, Lord Jesus, that anyone that is feeling sick, that you would heal them and you'll heal this earth. We need you, Lord Jesus. Lord, send the Holy Spirit into every single one of our homes, into the home of every single uh, member of this church, that you can prepare us to uh, sing your praises and, and take our eyes off of our old crutches, off of our old temptations, and onto you, the everlasting God. So, Lord, prepare our hearts for this time. We look to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go for it. Strength will rise and wait upon wait upon wait upon Strength will rise and wait upon wait upon wait upon Our God
You are the one we place our hope in. Not our nine to five jobs, not anything else, not our family, nor our friends, nor even our health, Lord Jesus. You are our hope. And 
thank the Lord, praise the Lord that you, when you are holy, you don't fail. Because you never failed, Lord. You didn't fail even in your battle against death. And we pray in the, in the name of Jesus that can become alive in every single one of our lives, Lord Jesus. That your victory will become our victory.
victorious. You are risen from the grave. Lord Jesus, I pray that in, uh, in the name of Jesus, that you'll send the Holy Spirit and eradicate any doubt that's, that's living in us, whether doubt that you are good or doubt that you even rose from the dead. We need you, Lord Jesus. So Lord, we dedicate the service and our homes and our lives to you. And Lord, may you be glorified in all of it. And Lord, thank you again. Thank you again for what you did for us. Pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, Jesus answers prayer. We've heard a few stories already of how Jesus has answered prayer, some big and some small, but Jesus answers prayer. Now, the problem is, as I see it, uh, it it's what James says. James says that Jesus doesn't, oh, all right, let's try this again. Friends, Jesus answers prayer. We've heard a few stories already of how Jesus has answered prayer, some big and some small, but Jesus answers prayer. Now, the problem, as James says in his book, it's not that Jesus doesn't answer prayer, it's that we too seldom pray and ask. James says that we have not because we ask not. And so as you think about your life, as you think about your hopes and dreams, your worries and concerns, your family, your job, your finances, are you seeing Jesus answer prayers? If not, are you actually bringing your requests to him? Today we wrap up our series on prayer from Luke 11, 1 to 4. In this passage, Jesus is praying and the disciples are listening. They hear Jesus talk to his father. They hear the confidence, the boldness he has in approaching the throne of grace. And they see that when Jesus prays, God answers. And so when Jesus is finished, they come to him and they say, Lord, teach us how to pray. And so Jesus launches into a familiar prayer. We know it as the Lord's Prayer. Now, the one you might remember or may have learned as a kid is, is taken from Matthew 6. Now, that one includes a few more elements. And what I think is happening in Luke 11 is that Jesus is reminding the disciples of the prayer that he's already taught them. I think the events of Luke 11 occur some months or maybe even a year or two after the events of Matthew 6. But I think the disciples are kind of like me, and I'm a bit of a slow learner. And so... They've heard Jesus teach them how to pray once already in the context of a vast crowd. But now as they gather with just him and, and, and their friends, now they're saying, Jesus, we need you to teach us how to pray again. And so Jesus reminds them, we're invited to pray our Father. Now this is a bold and intimate prayer. And because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, because of his death and resurrection, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we are actually invited into the relationship Jesus has with his father. God becomes our father. We can call him Abba, Daddy. We know he hears and cares about us. Now, we're also invited to pray, may your name be kept holy. And this is an invitation for us to come to God in worship. It's an invitation for us to confess our sinfulness to him, uh, but also to recognize and acknowledge that he is the holy one. We're invited to pray for his kingdom to come soon. And as we see those broken and desperate situations around them, we're invited to pray, God, bring your kingdom into those places and spaces. We're invited to come to him and ask for our daily bread. 
We're invited to come to him and pray for forgiveness, and we're expected to forgive others. Jesus reminds us in that part of the prayer that uh, we can come anytime we need to for forgiveness, but the implication and the expectation is that as uh, image bearers of the Father, as people who've been created anew in relationship with him, we should also be forgivers. We should be people who forgive others. Now, finally, in Luke, we're invited to pray, and don't let us yield to temptation. Now, this is a significant prayer. Temptations are real. We are constantly bombarded by temptations to join in all kinds of sin, to join with fear or anger or lust or hatred or greed or selfishness. And in the church, we often talk about sin. We often talk about resisting sin. But so often the message we present to you sounds like this. You need to say no to temptation. In your strength, in your power, you just need to be a better person. Just get rid of all that stuff and just be better. And what happens is that we make it all about you. We say that you are the answer. But this week, as I looked at the Lord's Prayer, I realized that Jesus invites us to take our struggles and temptations to him. He invites us to pray about our temptations and lean into him for the victory. Jesus says the key to defeating temptations in your life is prayer. And I think this is the missing weapon in our arsenal as we look to lead lead the kind of lives that Christ has called us to live. I think that this prayer is what we so often neglect. And I think that when we forget to pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation, I think that's when we fail to resist temptation. Prayer is the key. We just come through Easter, and did you notice what Jesus told his disciples to do in the garden? Did you notice what he asked them to pray? In Luke twenty two forty, 40, Jesus says to his disciples, pray that you will not give in to temptation. He wanted them to stand firm. His desire was that they would be bold in the midst of fear, that they would stand firm in the face of anger and resentment. But what did they actually do? They fell asleep. And they did not have the power in their own strength to resist fear as Jesus was arrested. They couldn't be good enough. They couldn't try hard enough when they were faced with a vast crowd with weapons and torches. uh, They just took off and ran. And so today we want to understand what it means to pray, don't let us yield to temptation. And we want to do that by looking at what Jesus' disciples and followers wrote about temptation in the New Testament epistles. We want to look at Jesus. We want to see what he did with temptation. And then as we end our time, we want to pray. And we want to equip you to pray to deal with the temptations you face in your life. So let me pray to start us off, and then we will explore what the New Testament writers say about temptation. Father God, we just come into your presence. We come boldly approaching your throne of grace because of the completed work of Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you are loving and kind and merciful. We thank you, Father, that you desire that we would become more and more and more like Jesus. And by your Holy Spirit, you're making it happen. And so, Father, as we talk about sin and temptations, we're not doing it um, because of condemnation. We're not doing it uh, to expose or to bring up any shame. But we want you, by your Spirit, to equip and to empower us to resist the temptations that come into our lives. We want to be who you've created us to be. And so by your spirit, would you open your word to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, temptation in the Greek, it's all about tests and trials, about those things that come into our lives and entice us to rebel against God. And as the various New Testament authors write about sin and temptation, together they tell the story of what we're facing in the world. Now, this message assumes one significant thing. As we talk about resisting sin, resisting temptation, the message assumes that you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus. It assumes that you've asked him to forgive your sin, that you've invited him to lead and guide your lives. 
This is the necessary first step in this whole conversation because Paul says that apart from Christ, we're dead in our sins. We follow the passions and desires of our sinful nature and we obey the devil. It it sounds harsh, but the Bible's pretty clear that apart from Christ, we can't be good enough. We can't do enough good works. We can't say no to sin enough. We can't fix ourselves. And even the best people, apart from the work of Christ, they can't earn their way into heaven. And so apart from Christ, we can work hard, we can beat our bodies, we can struggle and strive. But even if we have a measure of self-control, we still can't earn our way into heaven. Christ is the only path. The work that Jesus has done for us opens the door for us to step back into relationship with God. And when we do that, we go from being dead to being alive. We go from being slaves to sin to free. Rather than obeying the passions and desires of the sinful nature, we have a new capacity to allow God to transform us from the inside out by his spirit. And with his help, we can live new lives. He will make us more and more and more like Jesus. Through the spirit, we can say no to sin and temptation, and we can live new empowered lives. And it isn't to earn favor with God. Jesus has already said yes. He's already done everything for us. We don't, we don't earn favor with God by being good, but rather his transforming work in our lives allows us to become more and more like our heavenly father. And it equips us to do the work that he wants us to do in this world. In that Ephesians 2 passage that I referenced, it begins by talking about how once we were dead, But because of Christ's mercy, we've been made alive. Uh, Because we've been saved by grace, uh, we then become equipped to do the good works that God has planned for us to do in advance. And so the good works aren't a way to earn anything. We can't earn anything. But as we surrender to Christ, as we allow him to transform us from the inside out, then we're empowered to join with him on mission. It's incredibly exciting. And that's the first step, friends. We have to put our faith and trust in Jesus. Now, with that important note being said, what can we learn about sin and temptation from the New Testament authors? Well, the first author that I want to reference is Peter. Peter says that we need to realize that we have a very real enemy looking to take us down. In 1 Peter 5, 8, uh, Peter writes this. He says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Friends, as followers of Jesus, we have an enemy. And Peter tells us this enemy is on the prowl. He's on the hunt. He is moving to and fro in the world, looking for people he can snatch up. As Christ followers, Peter says we're to stay alert. We're to watch out. We're to recognize and resist the enemy. Now, Peter, in writing this, has some very unique perspective on this phenomenon. Because during the events of Good Friday, Peter was tested and tried. Jesus, when talking to Peter and the disciples in Luke 22, said that Satan had asked to sift the disciples like wheat. And we see in the events of Good Friday that each of them is sifted, and Peter most of all. See, Peter, he says to Jesus, even if they kill me, I will not deny you. I'm in it to the end. And then when the crowd comes to arrest Jesus, uh, Peter tries to kill people uh, to get Jesus off the hook. And then he runs away. And then he lies three times to save his own skin. The final time he swears on oath that he's never met Jesus. For Peter, Satan is real. Satan's our adversary. He's working against you. And so Peter wants you to know, friends, that you have an enemy. Now, the second thing that the writers of the the New Testament want us to realize, this time uh, from the book of James, uh, James says in James 1, 12 to 18, he says, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you're being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. 
These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word, and we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. James is teaching us a lot in that passage. Uh, He's telling us that God blesses you when you endure, when you stand firm in the midst of trial and difficulty. James wants you to know that God is never the source of temptation. It's not coming from him. He's not going to lead things into your life that will test you in that fashion. But what James really wants us to know is he wants us to know where temptation comes from. And that's the thing that I really want to highlight. See, temptation and sin are not the same thing. But temptation can lead us to sin as we feed and foster, as we agree with those temptations. Have you ever been in a room with a $100 bill? Have you ever been in a room with a stack of $100 bills? If you've ever been in a room where there's a lot of money, probably at some point in your mind, a a thought flashes through, I could use that money. Now, that thought is not inherently sin. It's simply a thought. It's a thought that can be resisted. But James lets us know that those thoughts, they come from our own desires. See, we like stuff. We like the comfort money can provide. We all have a bucket list of ideas in our minds. And and these desires, they're not inherently sinful, but it is fertile ground for sin to grow. If we allow these thoughts to drag us away, if we allow those thoughts to take root and grow. And so friend, it always begins in our minds. We think about the money. We think about what the money can do. We take a quick look around. Would this money be noticed if if we took it? Would we be noticed? Maybe we even form a plan. There's no security cameras. I've got a duffel bag here. And at that point, we can still back out. We don't have to participate in the sin. We don't have to agree and join with it. But our heart and our desires at that point are working against God's plan in our lives. It's exposing uh, where our trust often is. And as we join in with those things, those sins give birth to death. And so temptation and sin are not the same thing, but the temptations that come into our lives give us a window into the vulnerabilities of our heart, and they show us where we need Jesus' help to stand firm. So if you walk into a room full of money, you look at the money, you think, man, money would be really nice. And you recognize, okay, there's something discontented about my heart. And you can actually use that momentary temptation as a uh, plan, as a strategy, as a strength to say, Jesus, you need to work on my discontent. Please help me to be content only in you. And all of a sudden, not only have you resisted the temptation, but the temptation has turned into an inner healing moment where you are allowing Jesus by his spirit to help you to be content with what he has given you. Or what often happens is that the temptations feed and build and culminate. It's not just there's money here. It's I want this money. Oh, this money would buy some good things. I think I can get away with taking this money. And then we reach out, we grab a stack, we stick it in our pocket, and we joined in with sin. So James wants us to know that temptations, uh, they come into our heart, and as they find that fertile ground, they give birth to sin. The third thing I want us to learn about temptation from the writers of the New Testament comes from Paul. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12 to 13, if you think you are standing firm, be careful not to fall. The temptation in your life is no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Friends, what Paul says here is incredibly important. He says that all of us experience temptation. None of us gets a pass on this. But the most important element Paul wants us to realize is that God is in our corner. When temptation comes our way, God provides a way out. He has a blinking exit sign for you. 
You need to look around for it. You need to access it. God is faithful. He is on your side. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to endure. He wants you to stand firm. And so in our battle against temptation, we have an ally. God is on our side. And every time temptation comes into your life, God is providing you with a way out. You don't have to join in with sin anymore because of what Jesus has done for you. Sin is not your master. The chains of sin have been broken. We have a new capacity through the Spirit to say no. We just need to have eyes to see those exit signs. Where is God providing you with the way out? The final thing I want to show you comes from uh, the author of Hebrews. Uh, In Hebrews chapters 4 to 14, or sorry, chapter 4, verses 14 to 16, the author of Hebrews says this. So then, since we have a great high priest who's entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weakness, for he faced all the same testings as we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help when we need it most. What I love about this passage is that it reminds us that Jesus lived the human life. He experienced what we experience and he understands our weaknesses. He faced them all and yet he never sinned. Temptation came into his life and he was constantly able uh, with the Spirit's help to say no, to say no, to say no. The author of Hebrews says, because Jesus knows our weakness, we need to come to him in prayer. We need to come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive mercy and find grace to help us when we need it most. Friends, from these four different New Testament authors, we clearly see we have an enemy. We recognize that we have internal desires that can become fertile ground for temptations. We see that we have a faithful God who wants to transform our desires as we surrender the broken places of our lives to him. And in the middle of temptation, he promises us a way out as long as we take it. And we see that a huge key to experiencing the victory, a huge key to taking that way out is prayer. We need to be taking our problems and our burdens to the throne of grace and praying. And that's why Jesus tells us in the Lord's Prayer, pray, Pray, Father, don't let me yield to temptation. As I go into a room full of money, Father, don't let me yield to the temptation to become discontented and dissatisfied with the life that you've provided me to the point where I have to steal money. Don't let me yield, Jesus. So we've seen how the New Testament writers speak about sin and temptation. But how did Jesus experience, how did prayer experience Help Jesus stand firm. Well, we've just come through Easter, so let's focus our attention again on the journey to the cross. Now, the journey to the cross didn't just begin in the final week of Jesus' life. Uh, Luke tells us that very early, Jesus set his face like flint uh, towards Jerusalem. He knew what was going to be going on. And by Matthew 16, uh, Jesus is on that way. He knows he'll be betrayed and arrested. He knows he'll be sentenced to death and die in our place. And in Matthew 16, God reveals to Peter who Jesus really is. Uh, Peter says, uh, you are Christ, the son of the most high God. And, And Jesus says to Peter, you know, you didn't figure this out on your own. God revealed this to you. And Jesus speaks this incredible word over Peter. He calls him the rock. He changes his name. He declares that upon this rock, he'll build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then... He begins to explain the journey to the cross to the disciples. He begins to tell them what's going to happen to him in Jerusalem. And Peter takes Jesus aside and begins to rebuke Jesus. He says, Jesus, you can't die. The Messiah's path is not a path to death. You're talking crazy talk. Now listen to how Jesus responds to Peter. Jesus says, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. See, Jesus was talking to Peter, but Jesus recognized in Peter's words that there was an enemy behind those words. 
He recognized that the devil was prowling around looking for a way to derail the mission that Jesus was on. And Jesus stood firm. Jesus knew that he was in a battle against a very real enemy. Now, as Jesus moves towards the cross, as he experiences his last week, the final stop before his arrest is the garden. And listen to Jesus' words in Matthew 26, 39. Jesus says to the Father in prayer, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Friends, the suffering Jesus experienced was real. And like us, his humanity cried out to live. He wasn't looking forward with joy and delight to torture. Instead, he recognized the temptation to run away. He recognized that his body was not desirous of the path to the cross. But he prevailed in prayer. He submitted himself to the path of the cross. He prayed, not my will, but yours be done. When James was talking about how we have desires inside of our heart, desires where temptation can find root and grow into sin, Jesus' body had desires, desires not to be killed. But Jesus overcame and mastered those desires through prayer. Father, if it's possible... Take this cup away, but I want your will to be done, not mine. Now, as Jesus was arrested, his disciples fought back. And here is where the temptation to step out of the Father's will would have been the greatest. Here is the moment when the way out is most easily accessible. For here, in the chaos of the, rest, of the arrest, Jesus was faced with other choices. I mean, first, he could have faded into the night. I mean, think about it. All of Jesus's other disciples managed to escape. It's dark. They were able to just run crate away. While Judas betrayed him with a kiss, that garden was dark. And, and we actually get a sense in a few different times in the accounts that it was possible for Jesus to slip away. What's really interesting is, is in John. As you read about the account in John, uh, Jesus says, who are you guys looking for? And the crowd says, we're looking for Jesus the Nazarene. And Jesus just says, I am he. And this crowd with swords and, and torches, they drop to the, round, the ground in terror. And then they kind of pick themselves back up. And Jesus says, who are you looking for? Jesus the Nazarene. I am he. And they shrink again. I mean, they were petrified by Jesus. And in that moment, he could have just faded into the night. But he doesn't. His, he doesn't, he just stands firm. And, and I think that it would have been tempting for Jesus to simply walk away. But there's another temptation that I think would have even been worse. See, in Matthew 26, Jesus says to his disciples who want to fight, he says, don't you know that I could ask my father to send 12 legions of angels to protect us? And he would instantly. Snap my finger, friends, my army is here. Talk about temptation. One word and the journey to the cross ends. One word and the pain is gone. Moreover, the Jewish leaders would finally understand just who they were messing with. Man, that's temptation. My daughter Jordan is reading The Lord of the Rings, and as I was reflecting on The Lord of the Rings books, uh, there's several times where Frodo takes the ring, that one ring of power. Uh, first, he offers it to Gandalf and says, Gandalf, this ring is too big for me. You take it. And Gandalf has this temptation moment. He says, I would love this ring. This ring would give me power. I would want to use it responsibly, but. So Gandalf says no to the ring. I can't take it. He tries to give it to one of the elf queens, and she says, I would take this ring, and I would try to use it for good, but... And she says no to the ring. In the same way, Jesus has this moment where he recognizes one snap of the finger, and he could walk away from the cross. But Jesus doesn't give in to that temptation. He chooses the right path. And what's really interesting is how he chooses the right path. 
See, he tells his disciples that scripture, God's word has to be fulfilled. Remember how 1 Corinthians 10 tells us that there's a flashing exit sign? Well, the flashing exit sign for Jesus that helped him resist temptation was his father's will, his father's word. Because of what God had said through the prophets, Jesus stands firm. He allows himself to be arrested. He takes uh, another step on the journey to the cross. Now, finally, Jesus, in all of his trial and torture, Jesus continually goes to God in prayer. I'm not sure if you've ever really noticed this, but on the cross, a lot of what Jesus says is prayer. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's either saying things that are directly prayers or he's saying things to fulfill scripture. He says, I am thirsty to fulfill scripture. He says, it's finished. Now, there are two exceptions that I noticed. Uh, One, Jesus ensures that John will take care of Mary after his death. As the oldest son, that was his responsibility to care for his mother. Uh, And so he makes sure that someone else is looking after that responsibility. And then when one of the dying thieves asks for mercy, Jesus assures him that they will be together in paradise that very day. And so I noticed that as Jesus spent the last day of his life, when there were so many temptations to quit, to walk away, to come down from the cross, to get revenge, I noticed that so much of what Jesus did was pray. And he was able to resist the temptations that came his way. Friends, Jesus is the one who experienced every kind of trial and temptation that we experience, yet he never gave in. And this Jesus taught us to pray, Father, let us not yield to temptation. But I know in my own life that that's not often the way that I handle things when temptations come. When temptations come my way, I get angry with myself. I try to pull myself up by the bootstraps. I try to say, Nathan, just be a better person. I try to reschedule my life so tempting things don't get in my way. But that's not what Jesus did in the face of temptation. And it's not what he taught us to do. He taught us to pray. And so as we close our message, we want to give you time and space to pray. Some of you are in a room with your family, some of you are by yourselves, but wherever you are, I'm sure that as I've been talking about temptation, you already have a thought in mind. You know what's been coming against you. Maybe it's fear, maybe it's anger, maybe it's frustration. Maybe you've wanted to swear, maybe you struggle with lust. You know what the temptations are in your life. And we want to begin by acknowledging that you have an enemy who's after you. He wants to trip you up. And so no matter where you are or how long you've been walking with Jesus, the enemy is going to throw temptations your way. To experience temptation is to be human. But we also want to recognize that these temptations are often enticing because of what's in our heart. See, sometimes Satan will even take the positive things in your life. He'll take your hopes and your dreams. Uh, He'll take the promises that God has made to you. And he'll try to twist them. He'll try to make you take them in the wrong way. He tries to make you sin. Now, think about how he came after Jesus. He took a a lot of good things, you know? He took the words of Scripture even and tried to twist it so that Jesus would step in and join in with sin. But if we try to take things in the wrong way, it's sin. And what happens is often the temptations that come into our lives, they expose sin patterns or wounds that we're carrying. For example, if I'm feeling insecure, the temptation to steal might come against me because in taking money, I could have some control and have security back. If I'm feeling lonely, perhaps the temptation to lust would come against me. And as James says, temptations are a window into your heart. And so in your living room, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think about the temptations that come against you. And I want you to ask Jesus to help you see your heart. Ask him to show you what's going on in your heart that makes you want to give in to those temptations. Are you worried? Are you lonely? Are you afraid of losing control? Are you looking for validation? Whatever's in there, confess and repent of whatever he brings to you. Ask him to take those fears and worries away and invite him to give you new gifts to fill those areas. 
As James says, God doesn't tempt. Instead, every good and perfect thing comes down from the Father of lights. And Satan would absolutely hate it if every time he threw a temptation your way, rather than joining in with the temptation, you took the temptation to God and said, God, why does this temptation make me want to step out of your will? What is in my heart that makes me want to lust or steal? Where's the broken places that only you can fix? Friends, we need to bring uh, our hearts before him and invite him to bring the healing that only he can do. As we experience temptation, we need to also ask him to show us the way out. He promises in 1 Corinthians 10 that he's faithful, that he is with you every time temptation comes a knocking. And so ask him for eyes to see, ask him for ears to hear, ask him to show you that way out. And finally, begin to pray every day for your area of concern. Know that he has endured what you experience. Know that he's merciful and he wants us to boldly come to him and say, Father, I am wrestling with lust. I am wrestling with anger. I am wrestling with fear and I need your help. I need your strength. I can't do it on my own. Would you empower me by your spirit to walk away from temptation? And would you heal my heart so that I can stand firm? Friends, I want to pray for you. And then we want to give you a few minutes to pray yourselves, to take your burdens to him. And then the band's going to come and we're going to just worship again to just celebrate God. Uh, But we want to give you a chance to pray and invite God to do the deep work that only he can do in your hearts. So let me pray for you, then we'll give you space. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word stands firm. And I thank you, Jesus, that you experienced everything that we experience. You know our weaknesses. You know our trials, our difficulties. You know uh, what it's like to live on earth. And yet you also know what it's like to stand firm, to resist every temptation to sin. And God, today we want to ask you to lead us not into temptation, to protect us from temptation. We want your help. We want you to transform us from the inside out. And so in these next few moments, as as, uh, my friends just look to you uh, to heal their hearts, as they look to you to provide them with those exit exit doors, as they look to you uh, for your mercy and your grace, Jesus, would you meet them in every way? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right. Next, together we get to sing Raise a Hallelujah. And a bunch of lines in this. Uh, Raising a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. Louder than the unbelief. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. A lot of this, the storm still exists. The temptations still surround you. Pop up in your heart to bother you. But uh, I like to think about uh, worship or raising a hallelujah as like getting into an airplane. And so uh, while you're on the ground, the buildings, the mountains, everything around you seems so big. But as soon as you take off and into the air, all that just seems tiny. It's minuscule looking down on the ground. I think that's the same when we fix our eyes on how great and how big our God is, how powerful and what a healer he is. And uh, I want to encourage you to do that too. Hop into this airplane with us. And we're going to sing louder than the storm, louder than the unbelief.
friends, we get to raise a hallelujah because we have an awesome God who answers prayer. And we get to raise a hallelujah because he gives us victory and power uh, over the sin and temptation in our lives as we come to him. And so this week, remember, he invites you to pray, to pray that you will uh, not fall into temptation, to pray for your daily bread, to pray uh, that you'd forgive others. He invites us to come boldly into his throne room and call him Father. So as we close our time, let me just close with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he watch over you and give you his perfect peace. In Jesus' name, have a great week.